and welcome to my channel Haley Marie Vintage. Today we are kind of going back to travel vlog land. I know Tuesday is not my normal posting day but I kind of wanted to post what I did in Philly in a video and then do a New York video separately on Friday so that's the plan. This is partially to make sure the New York video isn't like hours long but also I am trying to help myself out a little bit with the algorithm by separating Philly from New York even though technically some of Philly is in New Jersey because I stayed in New Jersey technically. I didn't kind of realize that New Jersey and Philly were so close. I'm, I'm from a big state. I'm from Colorado and I am now in Washington and they're both big states that you can't really stumble into another state on accident. So that's the first two parts that are coming this week and then I'm going to show you my haul from the garment district when I picked up fabric wise and a couple weeks and then a couple weeks after that I'm going to show you all the vintage and antique and stuff that I picked up as well. So that's kind of the structure of these. They're going to be coming out in between my sewing videos and I thought it would be good to separate out the haul videos because I know my travel vlogs are kind of more for a niche audience. So that's the plan. So if you're not into travel vlog I do not take any personal offense. You can skip this week's videos. We'll be back with like hauls and sewing content very very soon but with that we're gonna hop into my trip to Philly so I took a red eye on a Friday night and then I stayed Saturday Sunday and part of Monday uh, I stayed with a friend in New Jersey she took me to a bunch of activities that are local that she knew of so in this video we're gonna do a little bit of vintage shopping a little bit of antiquing as well as visit the Eastern State Penitentiary and Philly's Magic Gardens but let's go ahead and get into the footage of my first day in Philly the first thing we did is we went to the Amish market and we got some pretzels and donuts and pie and things like that and then we were going to the Amish flea market it, but we were a little early in the season so there wasn't that much to look at so I didn't take any footage however after that we stopped at the browse around shop which is like an antique shop in the area where the Amish market is so we browsed around this shop was absolutely stunning they had also to me really good prices I loved this duck teapot but I said no Haley you cannot have a duck teapot you don't even use your other teapots so I left it overall this shop is like it's beautifully put together it is so fun to just look around and see how they've arranged things and then on top of it being beautiful the prices are good I picked up a few things here which I'll show you in a later video and I overall just enjoyed this shop a lot it was top tier for sure and not so overwhelming everything was staged like where there's tons to look at but not so much to look at that you're overwhelmed. Our next stop, I believe they're only open like once a month, is Bulk Vintage. They have like a warehouse floor. They also have an up above floor, which I'll show you in a second. This here is their warehouse floor. So basically they have vintage sorted into bins that are themed around things. So I was like looking through like their floral cotton dresses. This is a really, really great place to get really, really great priced. 80s and 90s vintage. Here is a montage of me trying on a whole bunch of dresses. I got some, I left some. It was pretty hard to stay reined in here because there were so many cute pieces. I was trying not to add anything unintentionally to my wardrobe, so I think what I bought, I bought with a lot of really, really great intention. So I'm pretty pleased with this, but I tried on, I'm showing you all the dresses I tried on, but on top of the dresses, I tried on I think like 30 skirts. I was really on a skirt hunt. Uh, they also had like some hung up kind of more beaded or special pieces like this cat dress which was so fun and I kind of filed that away for inspo for myself for a future project. But they had lots of like beaded stuff. I can definitely tell the way they source their vintage here is they get shipped like bales from thrift shops and then they grade them themselves. This is a really fun set that I considered but they were charging $35 for it and I would have had to completely redo the lining, soak out a lot of the staining on the sleeves. It was going to be too much work and then I took like no footage of their upstairs so I will talk about that in a second. All right so you've seen my first day in Philly. I've taken you along antique shopping and vintage shopping so I wanted to talk about bulk vintage and give you a little bit more context for a second. There are three floors I believe. They're only like technically open to the public once a month, uh, maybe twice a month. I'll link their Instagram down below. You can follow them and figure all that out. The first floor is a place to check your bags. And then the second floor is the warehouse you saw with all the big boxes. So everything here is priced really, really reasonably. Like not, I was going to say it kind of reminds me of the bins at Goodwill, but vintage. So it is a little bit more expensive, but most of the pieces I bought there were like eight bucks. So definitely like cheaper around honestly what I would pay at a thrift store here in Seattle for similar garments. That was kind of that floor and then the floor above it was their like 
cream of the crop best vintage floor and there were a lot of really really beautiful pieces there however in my opinion prices were out of my budget but they were also maybe higher than what the pieces were worth most things seemed to be above a hundred if not two hundred dollars and had very little cleaning or repairs work done on them if I'm gonna be paying over two hundred dollars for a vintage piece I expect the seller to have dry cleaned it to have mended it and done all that because like that's why you're paying that high premium price and I felt like a lot of their inventory was pretty damaged for the price definitely super super cool to look at really beautiful old pieces very like for me as a seamstress it was actually a very inspirational place to look I'll rotate through some photos over here if I have photos to rotate you through some really 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 beautiful garments just definitely priced above their market value essentially for example there was a 23 to 24 inch waist gunny sacks there that was like pretty common gunny sacks that you see that was marked at like $650 and I can tell you as a avid gunny sacks shopper that gunny sacks is maybe worth 200 tops it more likely is honestly an $150 gunny sacks so I just felt like their pricing was just kind of out there but that's kind of my final thoughts and then the antique shop we went to was fun the Amish market we went to unfortunately they it was like too early in the season so there wasn't much vintage most of it was kind of like the goods you see hawked at a normal market. I don't know how to explain that, but like if you're kind of at a flea market, it was just more like typical flea market as opposed to like vintage flea market, if that makes sense. And then now we're gonna jump into more footage of the next day where we actually headed into Philadelphia proper. The next day we headed into Philly proper using both the train system and the bus system. I always recommend trying to use public transit when you're in a city. I'm taking this footage here from a bus downtown and I really love the mix of this beautiful old architecture with some really beautiful skyscrapers in the background. Obviously not that one, that one's chunky. But yes, there is a lot of dirt on the windows. Forgive me for that. I could probably just like ride around on buses in cities like this and stare out the window and thoroughly enjoy myself. So uh, here is some of that footage. I love cities that just have that mix of old and new, right? And I think what's fun about and like maybe a little bit different about American cities than some of the other cities I've traveled to is it feels like things are more blended. I feel like in other cities I've been in, there's like the modern part of the city and the old part of the city. But here it very much feels like like one block you're at modern and the next block you're not. I am sure that's just like a general stereotype, but it is something I've observed while traveling. And I honestly really liked Philly. I think it's a really, really, really cute city. So our first stop in the city was the Eastern State Penitentiary, which is a museum devoted to a pretty early prison in America. This was super fascinating. If you enjoy history and social dynamics and stuff, I like 100% recommend going here. I was a bit skeptical when my friend recommended it because from my experience, a lot of these types of places like they don't frame themselves well. They kind of almost delight in the bad things that happen there and don't talk and put things into context enough. But it was interesting here to learn about like kind of how the intention of this prison was for it to, it was actually like a reformed version of prison, even though we would consider this incredibly barbaric essentially, because uh, the idea was everyone was in isolation all the time. But in the prisons of the time, there weren't really anything but like holding because all there was was like public stocks hanging. There was other forms of punishment that didn't involve like basically like time alone and a lot of those prisons you would actually die in because of the disease. So the idea of this prison was to keep it really clean. It was very religious based that you were going to be like more pious and you were going to spend a lot of time in solitary like thinking about and reforming yourself. Of course today we now know that this is incredibly incredibly hard on the human psyche. Isolation like this is I believe constitutionally cruel an unusual punishment. So it was, I guess, good intention for a prison, but ultimately humans and power are flawed. So of course it ended up not good. There's all sorts of problems with this prison. But the other thing I liked about visiting here is I feel like the, so they basically talked about how there were two types of prison systems that arose at this time. I can't remember the other one. This one, which the isolation was just too expensive or initially they could only hold like 250 prisoners. So eventually they completely changed it to kind of more of a working jail where you might have four people in these cells and they also did a two-story cell blocks which is kind of what you're seeing here and then of course when you have that you have disease spreading there also were a lot of problems with you know guard abuse of 
prisoners, uh, kind of the standard stuff you hear about in prisons, both in the past and today. What I really, really appreciate about this is they spent a lot of time gathering testimonials, not just by guards or wardens or the people who you would normally expect. They really, really do a good job of focusing on the voice of the prisoners here too, because I think this closed in the 70s, so there are still people living who were imprisoned here. And I appreciate how much they tried to kind of center around the prisoners themselves and not just the people in power or like the grand idealists. Like I said, I was highly skeptical in visiting this, but I think they absolutely handle it well. And then they also talk a lot about kind of prison status in the U.S. today, how the like private person system has grown, and also like getting caught with a crime, what it has to do with the fact of your class and your financial status and stuff. Like here, so 1970 is when the prison closed, and this is like the prison population, and then the other red is obviously today. So they just like really did a good job like contextualizing and making you think about prison systems and how we use prison systems here in the U.S., I love an exhibit that essentially like doesn't stop the story in history but continues it into today. Like here they're showing world's highest like prison with um, who has capital punishment and who doesn't. They're showing like the racial breakdowns here of like 1970 to today showing kind of the incarceration essentially the disproportionate incarceration of like I said BIPOC people. I just think they they did just such an impressive job taking something that is historical and bringing it into the present to really make you think. I just think it's so easy for these type of spaces to become so much about like oh, here's all the torture we did to people in the past. And I think they just did a really good job linking it to today. And they have a whole exhibit here just talking about like prisons today and like million dollar blocks, which is essentially blocks that we spend like a million dollars on prisoners who come in from those blocks. And that's basically how we invest in Americans' poor neighborhoods. And I just... I just like 10 out of 10 recommend this is they had multiple art exhibits. Uh, they clearly pay artists and hire them to do artwork in these like deteriorating cells. And here you see this is all the victims of a like specific serial killer. And here, I don't know if you can tell, but somebody's put in a mirror and it's like a mirror reflection of the ceiling, kind of a play on light. There were just, there were a lot of really, really, really interesting art exhibits. Here in this one, we're in death row. The other thing I guess like I appreciate, which I've talked about this I think in past videos, I love history exhibits that like kind of let things like they stabilize and ruin the way they stabilized here as opposed to restoring it to its old whatever you want to call it. Like they have a couple places they've restored stuff, but I like that they're just kind of more focused on like preserving what's there as opposed to building what's on it. Um, I just overall was really impressed with the ethos of this organization. I feel like trying to tell the story of prisons in America is a huge challenge and the fact they did so well on it is really, really big deal. From here we're back on a bus, which is why you see these little dots. We are headed to a much more light experience and we are going to a big art garden in Philly. This is Philadelphia's Magic Gardens. I was initially also skeptical of going to this because it kind of looked like an Instagram trap, but I was informed that this was built much before Instagram. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of art installations that seem to just be there to be social media content essentially and isn't like critically thought of art, which I know is very ironic given I am social mediaing here by putting this on YouTube. So from their website, Philadelphia's Magic Gardens is an immersive mixed media art environment that is completely covered with mosaics. The creator, Isaiah Zagar, used handmade tiles, bottles, bicycle wheels, mirror, and international folk art to chronicle his life and influences. This space is made up of two indoor galleries and a bi-level outdoor sculpture garden. So what I did, I think, love the most here is the folk art sculptures that he worked with international folk artists on because I think 
folk art is so cool and it's like an underappreciated art form. So any of the like mermaid statues or other statues you see here is that folk art. And you see like a lot of folk art that you can tell is kind of like representational of gods and things. And this was just like really, really cool, which is maybe a really boring summary. But as somebody who loves ceramics, I also just loved the like mix use of things. Again, I come from an art background. This is essentially one really, really giant, not just mosaic, but assemblage. An assemblage is actually a really, really, really challenging art form to work with. Having this like this is really, really, really impressive because I've done assemblages and getting assemblages to like look right is incredibly hard. So the fact that this is just like one big assemblage, that there's just so much to look at, but things feel really balanced is really, like I said, challenging. For granted, I think my mind is just rigid to be particularly good at assemblages. But yeah, no, this was just like so neat. And it was also such like a great example of like reuse in art, which is something else that I'm pretty passionate about. While he does, of course, make his own tiles and hired people to do his own figures you see lots of glass bottles lots of broken pottery and the like older folk art that he didn't commission where broken pieces weren't considered valuable anymore so those got incorporated in and then the use of like bike wheels to create windows and lights and kind of hold things together structurally was incredible. I thought this was incredibly fascinating. It was way less of a tourist trap than maybe I was thinking on my first like look at the site, but it is really crazy. There's not a ton of opportunity I feel like anymore to be truly like in an artist's work like this. I feel like a lot of now ex experiential art is so focused on looking good at social media that it's actually sometimes hard to get a sense of the artist. Of course, that is like a general statement. I do think there is a space for like art for social media. I just like personally in the art I'm going to enjoy, that is what is not for me. I prefer art that is kind of more for art's sake if that makes sense. And I know that kind of probably sounds pretty judgmental. I, there's n nothing I can do about that. Uh, it's just my preference. Yeah, this is also like a highly recommend place to go and like spend some time and look. I saw a lot of people go through this pretty fast, which is wild to me. I think we went through it twice because there's just so many little things to see and I loved them. Like I just like love all these like little statues and I just really appreciated the work in it. I don't know that I have like a huge summary wrap up here, but this was really enjoyable and it was also a good contrast to kind of having been in such a space with hard energy in it as that prison and to kind of go into a space that's a little bit more joy focused and art focused, but also very like intellectually stimulating. Our next stop is Anastasia's, which is a antique store in Philly. If you are like obsessed with the Victorian era, this is a must see. Just the jewelry case alone was pretty insane. Lots of hair art, warning jewelry, combs, like just really, really impressive collection of goods. So even if you don't have money to spend, it is 100% worth stopping in. It is like looking at a museum. I of course did buy some things because I'm me. And again, those will be shown up in a follow-up video but this was just another antique store that I just think is like very delightfully laid out. I don't feel like there's really an antique store in Seattle that like is just so intentionally and thoughtfully laid out the way that the ones I saw in Philly are but I've also just like never seen so much hair art in my life. These are a bunch of like hair and mourning little things and I think it was very impressive collection. I talked to the owner she clearly knows a lot and yeah it was just a really unique collection. Also like just the lamps here were really cool. Uh, I, I appreciate somebody who appreciates lighting. Lighting is actually a like skill I'm not great at. Like how to light a space and make the vibe better by the way you light a space. And I think that the person who arranges the store is very, very successful at using light. I mean, like, look at this. This is stunning. And I would never think to use this many mixed lights to create an effect like this. I did feel very, very tempted by some of the glassware here, but I talked myself out of it because I still had to make it to New York with the same suitcase and then make it home on a plane. She had some incredible hairy. I thought they, have about 500 to $600, were not outrageously priced. But this is my first time I've definitely ever seen hair wreath art for sale so that was just interesting like i said this is like being in a museum and so i highly recommend checking it out
And we, of course, ate a bunch downtown and stuff like that, but it was time to take the train back out of Philly. You can see the golden light. We were trying to get out of the city kind of as fast as possible because we were there on St. Patrick's Day and people were already starting to get pretty rowdy and it was like six o'clock. So we were trying to escape and get home well before the full rowdy was out and about. And it's the next morning and I really just have a half day here today. I'm heading out to New York around noonish. I'm trying to get in before rush hour, but here is feeding time with the cute cats. This is the only time I think you'll be able to see all four of them together because they, two of them are fairly scared of me. This is my dream. My dream is to have probably actually only three cats, but I don't know. I just like, look at this long boy. I just, I loved spending time with my friend's pets. Her cats were so fun to watch with their shenanigans. And then her little dog, Sam, was so cute and he loved me so much and he slept with me a couple nights, which I was so happy about. It was so great. He's, he's such a little cutie. Also, I will say staying at my friend's house has me fully convinced that I need a sun porch in my future home. I loved being able to sit out here. It's a really great space for cats. Sun porches are a thing here in Washington, but like less of a thing, but I noticed here in Philly, it seemed like probably at over 50% of the houses had some form of sun porch. And it was also really nice to have like an indoor space to take my shoes and coat and stuff off that wasn't like actually inside my home. And if I was to have three cats, this could kind of double as like my space and catio. So it is something now that's kind of on the back of my mind for hopefully eventually having a future home. I've spent time in people's screened porches and I haven't liked them as much. I think I am definitely like a windowed sun porch type of gal, especially if I'm staying here in the Pacific Northwest. But yeah, the cats are so cute. All the kitties. Uh, we have three of them here, which is great because Krampus, who is the cat on the windowsill, is deeply afraid of me. And then this is Grendel. And that was knocked. And yeah. And the little Tordy you saw, his name is Pippin. Here, I am headed to New York on the train again. I'm really bummed, sorry for the grainy, like weird gross footage. The windows were so hard to see out of, which I was so bummed at because I love being on trains and looking out the window and you could barely see out these windows. So now we are at wrap up. You have seen my footage in Philly, got a little pet tour of my friend's place. Overall, I really, really, really enjoyed Philly. I would like to go back there, go a little bit more in depth. There were actually quite a lot of museums and attractions I wanted to see. So I will be back for Shirzies. I really, really, really enjoyed the city and being there and the food was good. And yeah, just definitely would recommend checking out Philly. It was well worth it. I don't know how to explain it like compared to New York. Like I feel like it's just, it was a little bit of a chiller vibe, just a little bit smaller, but still a lot of really interesting niche things there. And the museums and the history in Philadelphia is pretty crazy. So there's lots of things for you to check out. So I just overall would really recommend visiting. And with that, I'm going to head to New York in the next video, which you will see on Friday at my normal time. So definitely subscribe and stick around if you would like to see that. And I will see you then. Bye.